Okay. Um, how many of you already know anything about Servo? <laughs> Obviously, the Servo team, a couple of people. Okay, so uh, if you, I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff kind of quickly. If you have questions, I can answer them at the end or during, or we'll have the little uh, session afterwards. Okay, so why didn't that change? That is not moving. Okay, so the goal of Servo is to create a new browser engine with a generational leap in performance and robustness, um, which I think hopefully everybody knows. The, the reason we thought this was possible has to do, uh, you know, just performance, performance improvements that have been made over time and some, up, and some you know, observations that we made. So browsers keep getting more parallel, but they get there in sort of coarse ways, like having you know, different tabs and different processes and things like that. They've got video decode on their own threads um, and those kinds of things. But if you look at the structure of, of, you know, just pages by themselves, you can see they have lots of these repeated patterns and very fine structure. And it seems reasonable to think that we could, you know, calculate layout and style information and all that kind of stuff for each of these little boxes all by themselves. So on the left, you have like Pinterest, which has the sort of regular structure of these little cards. And then like news sites also have this sort of structure where they have the same kinds of layouts repeated over and over. Um, on the robustness side, we're depending on a lot of our robustness stuff uh, from the Rust programming language, which we sort of developed for making Servo, although now it's, uh, it's, it's long had a life of its own. Um, so we did some initial sort of data mining in our bug database to figure out like what kinds of bugs this would solve. So in the web audio implementation in Firefox, which doesn't have any of its own sort of security properties, there were 34 security critical bugs filed. This has probably increased since we got these numbers like two years ago. Um, all of them were use after free or array out of bounds exceptions, and they all would have been prevented by the Rust compiler, assuming that the web audio implementation had been written in safe Rust. So that's sort of what we're trying to go for. Um, there's also some other security proper, uh, robustness properties that we get from Rust, uh, which I'll talk about a little later, which is that we can catch a failure on a finer grained level than C++ generally can. Um, so we released Servo Nightly at the end of June. Um, you can grab it from uh, servo, download.servo.org and uh, give it a spin if you haven't seen it already. So this shows you a little bit about what it looks like. Um, this is using our uh, front-end code, which is all written in HTML and JavaScript itself, called browser.html. Um, pa page load times are still a little slow because we don't have production-level caching infrastructure or anything like that, but interaction with the pages is, is quite fast. Um, so like this is an example. This page takes forever to load, but once you're, once you're there scrolling and all that stuff and over-scroll and all those things are quite fluid and nice. Now we do the hunt for the mouse cursor. Here we go. So this seemed to be pretty well received and got exactly sort of the response we were looking for. We knew that a bunch of the stuff wasn't as fast as, as uh, the other browsers, but sort of the interaction with pages uh, um, was really smooth and we wanted to get that across. And at least for this person, we managed to do that. So we, we sort of proceed with server development along all of these different branches. And the idea is that we, when we find a place where we think we can make a solid performance improvement or robustness improvement, we sort of investigate that area, try to do the implementation, and then maybe further projects spawn off from there. And we've done four of these basically so far. Um, parallel layout, parallel style, um, web render, and constellation. I'm going to talk about each of those. So. Parallel style and layout, the idea was basically take the existing layout algorithm, layout rules from the specs and CSS styling rules and do them as parallel as possible. Presume, you know, like the best we could get is you can lay out every DOM node simultaneously, which isn't quite possible. Um, and if you want to know more about exactly the algorithms that we developed to do this, I, there are other presentations or you can ask me afterwards. Um, there's only so much time to cover stuff, so. Uh, I'm going to skip the details about how that works, but I'll instead I'll show you the results. So these is comparing Servo versus Gecko, just the layout and the style portions. 
um, on Wikipedia, which Wikipedia turns out to be sort of a bad case for us because anything that has um, float left, float right, uh, tends to break the parallelism stuff for the subsection of the tree that, that exists for. And so Wikipedia has that sidebar that's floated right through almost the whole page. So, so this is sort not quite worst case, but kind of a bad case for Servo. And you can see the performance gain is quite substantial uh, for Wikipedia. But when you get to something that has, doesn't have so many floats, like Reddit, then we're, we're, we get ridiculously fast. Um, these numbers are a little bit old. I think they're about two years old, but um, they, at least the style portions we know are, are uh, hold up today, and the layout portions probably got a little faster, I think. So the other side of this is we did some measurements on battery performance. And the easiest way to test this that we found was we underclocked uh, desktop CPUs basically by turning off Turbo Boost which reduces the performance by about 30%, but the power usage goes down by more than that, by about 40%. So it turns out that Servo makes up enough performance gain uh, by going parallel that we can make up all of the performance lost by turning off Turbo Boost, and we basically get the, you know, the same or better, slightly better performance at 40% less power, which is kind of nice. We haven't yet replicated this for uh, mobile devices, mostly because it's pretty hard to figure out how to jigger with the clock speeds of mobile CPUs without running your own Linux kernel stuff. Um, so, so now, those have been in there for a while. We've been working on that stuff probably the longest. And so now we're starting to take some of this stuff that we've built and try to wire it into the Gecko engine. So we have a project right going on right now called Stylo, uh, which a couple of people here are actually working on. Um, and we're trying to take basically the exact same CSS style code in Rust and use it from Gecko. Uh, and we put this together, I think, late last year, the initial experiment, and we're able to replicate all of the performance numbers that we had previously uh, done for our, that I showed you, the Servo versus Gecko tests. But this was done by Gecko engineers, so we're pretty confident that, that they were correct this time. Um, so that was good. We have uh, some telemetry in there in Firefox to measure you know, what percentage of our user base would get some kind of benefit. We already measure sort of how many cores they have. So it, it, based on this data, it looks like you know, about 95% of Firefox users have at least two cores, which means they'll get a 2x performance improvement in the style system, which is, the Rust implementation basically scales linearly with number of cores. And like 50% of our population will get a 4x speed improvement here. So this, we have had, a couple of things in Rust uh, land in the Gecko code base already, but um, they were sort of smallish libraries. This would be the first major piece. Um, and it's, it's taking uh, quite a number of people to kind of pull it off. Um, here's some of the initial numbers. This is Gecko running in a, a container that you can switch the style engine between Stylo and the one in Gecko. Uh, so you can see here with uh, with, without Stylo, it takes 131 milliseconds, and with Stylo, we're down to 26. Um, so this is uh, Wikipedia. And then also have results for the HTML5 single page spec. Uh, without Stylo, it takes 1.5 seconds, and with Stylo, about 271 milliseconds. So it's about five times faster um, in, both, in both those cases. Um, does it look slightly different? Yeah, we didn't we didn't have background image support and some kind of uh, 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 that property and also I think when that screenshot was taken, we still didn't have few properties implemented. But that's basically made a center from the Rust track to the Gecko one, so uh, it's not like a huge uh, like showstopper. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the work that they've been doing now is making sure all the properties work. Um, I don't think it will affect the, the numbers too much, those, those couple of properties. But the nice thing here is this is going to result in re real page load performance improvements. So I think the initial measurement that we did here was the whole spec took, I don't know, seven or eight seconds to load. And so this shaves you know, more than a second off page load, which is kind of substantial. I think it was like 20 or 30 percent on pages that were style heavy. So that seems like it's pretty promising. 
So the next part is web render. This is, uh, yeah. As a question about style of sure. As a, I just wonder about the how the performance would go in the worst case scenario because I, actually I didn't I didn't see the code of the server, so I did not know how you parallelize the style tree. But uh, I think if the web content JavaScript if JavaScript writes something. In that case, yeah, if you use a speculation, if you use speculation while the styling, in that case, you should abandon the component of other, other results, the calculated results, because it has a dependency on the other siblings or child. So I just wonder uh, how performance would go in the worst case scenario. If it was the case, in the worst case scenario, there's no big problem. In that case, that's really impressive, impressive result. So the worst case scenario, I guess, would be that you can't parallelize anything or that there's only one thing, and so you, the multiple cores don't help you. The, at least in the servo case, the single thread of performance is, actually, is, fa is still faster than Gecko. It's not, as, uh, it's not as dramatic. I think it's like on the order of 10% or something like that, mostly probably due to aggressive inlining that the Rust compiler does uh, across modules and things. I don't know whether that particular performance improvement will make it in the Gecko integration. Do you know? Your question was something related for uh, how script interacts while. Yeah, my, my question is if there is a document write comment, in that case, we should amend the other tree. <coughs> other tree, uh, yeah. So if you parallelize the. Yeah, but, yes. Yes. So a script is always blocked when you're dialing. So we parallelize the styling task. Like, let's say you have. Uh, <laughs> As a tree to style because it has just been appended to the document. Mm -hmm. So we parallelize that, that, that styling. Mm -hmm. But while we're styling, the uh, script is still blocked. Like we use the same restyling infrastructure that KB uses. So. Uh, yeah, so you block the script and then after yeah, the that side, OK, I see. Yeah, so there shouldn't be sort of a, a worst case because like script was already blocked while styling was running. I guess the worst case would be. If every element is, uh, has a single child mm -hmm. and there is no sibling, in that case, because of inheritance, we have to wait for the parent to be initialized. Yeah. But I think it's pretty rare to not have any siblings in this age. So we should be able to get parallelism in every case. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's the what I want to do with that. I want to say, so. Uh, that's my biggest concern, why the parallelized the crashing and layout stuff. If there does turn out to be overhead with the parallel versions on sort of these worst case things that can't parallelize, we have uh, worked with some external researchers, which I'll talk about later, to use uh, ways to switch uh, which algorithm we, we implement. Uh, so it occurs more with layout than with style, I think. So the web render side is a new project that we started um, at the end of last year. And the idea was, you know, we basically, the idea of Servo was to take all the browser that was running on one of these things and run it on all of these things. But then if you look at these uh, chip uh, d dive photos, you can see that like almost half of the core, um, almost half of the chip is GPU. So what can we move there? Because anything we move there is like free performance on the CPU. So it seems reasonable to move graphics there, and traditionally browsers have been trying to do that, but uh, we thought we could do it a little better. So the way WebRender works, or, or the, the sort of thing is, it doesn't seem to work very well to optimize a media mode. You can do some things, but it's very hard because you lack the information you do. Uh, you lack the information you need to make good optimizations. So retain mode graphics are a much better fit here for GPUs. Um, we also noticed that like web pages are basically their own scene graphs. Like they describe everything up front. We could just you know translate that into GPU objects, upload all of it to the GPU at once, and then get let the GPU you know take advantage of all of the compute it can. Um, there is parallel side CPU preprocessing for some things that the GPU can't do well. So font rasterization is one of them. We also do all of the GPU batch creation in parallel. Um, Rust makes that really easy. Um, and we do border radius. We you know so pre-draw those to a texture and then and then have all the versions uh, uploaded available to use. So this turns out to be extremely fast. Um, let's see. So so before I show you sort of the speed of it, um, this is the basic 
uh, progress of it, we, we, we had this initial experiment, which I talked about, which looked really promising. So we landed it in Servo, then we worked on fixing bugs to make it render everything that Servo could draw. Um, we did a bunch of optimization, and then that got shipped uh, in the Servo Nightly in June. Um, there were a couple of edge cases that we didn't handle well. One was that we couldn't do subpixel AA with this technique. The other big one was that there was a significant amount of overdraw, which in large cases, in, in complex cases on 4K displays, made it so we couldn't hit the frame budget. Um, so Glenn came up with a, a completely new design, which he claimed was as radical as, uh, from web render one, the original web render as web render was from the stuff that we were doing before. So that is now uh, finished and landed in the tree. Uh, we're getting ready to flip it on by default once we fix the last few test automation bugs. Um, and this, uh, it doesn't support subpixel AA yet, but it actually will be able to. So all of the stuff is there to do subpixel AA. Uh, it minimizes overdraw, so it's actually much faster in complex cases um, than web render one was. So here's an example. This might actually be a web render two example um, that the DevRel team at Mozilla prepared. So this just shows you sort of the smoothness of the transitions between the two browsers. It's it's quite shocking. Um, I don't think for this particular one the it's as um, it's as different as Chrome. It's still quite a bit better, but the Firefox one is quite different. Um, the next one I wanted How to show uh, I will show you. So the next one, oh, somehow I skipped multiple ones. So this one shows, this is with WebRender 1, right when we landed it in the tree. And this shows WebKit, Chrome, Servo, and Firefox, I believe, all together. So you can see 15 frames per second in Chrome, 9 frames per second in uh, Firefox, five frames per second in WebKit nightly, and then no problems hitting 60 FPS in Servo. Um, I believe with this test, we can still hit 60 FPS like even on mobile and stuff, so it's, it's quite a bit faster. It's, it's frame capped to VSync. Uh, I think it actually renders something like 200, 300 frames per second uh, if we let it. So this work seems quite promising. Um, there is some initial work to see what we can do to get this in Gecko as well. Um, but we're much earlier sort of in that process. I have another one, one yeah. So, yes, so what is, which one is tested in this test case? So did you test the rest writer or did you test the animation? So I believe that this, are, this is a bunch of DOM elements. Um, yeah. I can send you a link to the code probably. And they're, they're updated with JavaScript with like request animation frame. Um, but the, all of um, Servo's CSS transitions and animations are also um, done on the GPU and in parallel. So like, I think these tests aren't something that you would create normally. Like uh, some of the tests we do, we create massive numbers of DOM objects with like border radiuses to do crazy effects, um, which you know, is not something normally people are gonna do, but, but uh, it's sort of a simulation for complex, uh, complex web pages. So we've, we've done some real world web page testing and we have no trouble hitting frame budget on in any of those things. Um, I don't think Chrome with the GPU backend has much trouble hitting frame budget on normal websites either. Um, but when you get some complexity in the websites, you can see Chrome frame rate starts to drop and especially on mobile it might drop. And th th this is That's still impressive. That's impressive to that is a rise in operation. GPUs are fast. Um, Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about of the stuff that we've been worked on is the constellation. So, so this one is a little more complex. So basically what we've done is we have isolated script and layout to their own threads and let them run simultaneously when possible. So we take HTML and C JavaScript and CSS into the script thread. It you know, runs, it outputs a, a flow tree, uh, which is like the frame tree in Gecko. I'm not sure what it's called in uh, WebKit and, and Blink. And then we have a layout thread which consumes that and produces the display list, which then gets you know, sent right into web render itself. And so the nice thing is here is that we can run these at the same time uh, and not block. Um, if we have cross-domain iframes, this is even better because each iframe, each piece will get its own script thread and its own layout thread. So now the iframes can run simultaneously and not uh, jank each other. Um, if the 
in the case where there are synchronous iframes, um, we have to sh we use the same script task for both of them, like you have to, and but they still have independent layout. Now the nice thing is is that uh, for the cross-domain iframe case, uh, it also works for sandboxed iframes. Um, has the sort of the same properties, and so you get the extra parallelism with sandboxing as well. Uh, so it's possible web developers could take advantage of this to uh, add parallelism to their sites where, where it isn't possible with JavaScript now. Um, so there's lots of benefits here. One is iframes don't block their parent pages or each other in the case that they're sandboxed or cross domain. This turns out to be every ad on the internet <laughs> will now not jank the main content, which we think is pretty cool. Um, layout and script don't always block each other. Now obviously there's some cases like during flow construction where, the, where we, they can't both go at the same time, but once flow construction is done, then layout is free to keep going and script can return to executing. Um, so, and, and there's lots of cases uh, where we can run them both at the same time. We're trying to get the flow construction case <laughs> down even further, so there's some research I'll talk about later working on that. And also, failures can now be handled uh, independently. So if some piece of page content causes a, a problem, a panic in, in our case, or a crash in, in other browsers, um, you know, before you either had to lose the whole tab, the whole group of tabs, the process, or whatever. In Servo, like, if it's a layout bug, well, we'll just, we can restart layout from the flow tree, and the user may not e ever even know anything bad happened. If script fails, uh, we can take some action, but the layout and the display list and scrolling and all that stuff can still go on. And if a single iframe in the page fails, then that sort of only applies to that iframe. So if an ad causes some, something to go wrong, it won't take down the content site, like you'll just see a blank box where the ad is, and then you can keep going as you're going with Gmail or whatever you're using. Um, so when we put this all together in the multi-process uh, version of Servo, we basically have a privileged main process which runs web render and the constellation manager, and then the content process runs uh, each of these uh, pipelines. Um, so this is an example of two tabs where the second tab has a cross the main and a same origin uh, iframe. Um, so the nice thing about Rust here is that, you know, like I said, this tab can fail, and even though they're in the same process, we can still recover and nothing happens in the first tab, or you know, any, in any individual one of these orange boxes could fail, and only that orange box is affected, and we can recover from there. Actually, with Rust, it's a little nicer because we even get stack traces bubbled up through JavaScript for what actually happened. So you can take quite complicated uh, corrective actions here. Um, like I said, you could allow them to still scroll the page even though they can't change anything on it, or, or you could show messages or, or whatever you want there. Um, so we're doing a, a bunch of new things now, uh, having got pretty far with the, the first four. So one that we're uh, beginning to explore right now we call Magic DOM, the idea, the idea there being uh, how can we make DOM even better? And then we have a bunch of sort of parallelism things like how much more of the browser can we parallelize? On the magic DOM side, uh, we want to get significant performance wins in the integration between the JS engine and the DOM implementation. We've had a bunch of ideas for the whole life of the Servo project, but we had uh, last year uh, an engineer at Mozilla presented some, some interesting ideas, and so we're uh, going to start exploring that this year. Um, one, one of the original ones we had was can we get rid of this sort of two object thing with uh, reflectors and DOM objects and put them in the same object either by you know allocating the the Rust side implementation as part of the JS object in the free slots. Um, and then on top of that we thought uh, you know you can instead of putting Rust uh, values in those slots. You could put JS native values in those slots, and then if you have, uh, you know, write self-hosted JS for piece of DOM implementation, then all this stuff can be jitted and be super fast. Um, so we're starting to explore this and see what's possible there. Hopefully next year I'll be able to share some nice uh, performance graphs. So we've also done quite a bit of parallelism experiments in random other places. A project I worked on earlier this year uh, based on some work that we did on the DALA project is a JPEG decode on the GPU. Um, and the idea here is that you do the initial entropy decode on the CPU, upload coefficients, which ends up being about 20% smaller than the image data you would have had to upload to the compositor, and then you use the GPU to simultaneously 
uh, uh, run the, inver you know, the inverse transform on every block simultaneously. And you do the color correction and all of that stuff in the same time. So I, I think this was going to be a double performance win that you save a whole bunch of time on the upload, and then you save a whole bunch of time on the decode. Um, we tried to do the same thing for PNG, which is much harder because it's almost a pure entropy decode thing. Um, some of the thinking there was, even if it was slower on the GPU, would we be freeing up the CPU to do more layout and script things that were actually the, you know, the, the long pull and the performance tent on page load? Um, when we did this, we discovered that libpng doesn't have any CPU parallelism built in. Like it uses SIMD, but it doesn't use multiple threads. So we wrote a version that does multiple threads. It's much, much faster than any other PNG implementation that we can find. Um, so hopefully we'll get that into servo uh, pretty soon. Uh, we're, we've done some initial exploration with glyph rasterization on the GPU. This one is much harder. Um, we've done a, a few sort of small case tests and we still have sort of a lot, long way to go on that side. Okay, we've been working with a bunch of uh, academic institutions on various projects related to these. So one that we did, uh, it's kind of interesting, is this machine learning project. So the idea is in the, in the style case, like we said, um, there's not a whole lot of um, worst case scenarios to prepare for. But in the layout case, there's a lot of them and the overhead of the parallel layout uh, stuff D does sometimes add up a little bit and the parallel one can be slightly slower than the serial one. So the idea was can we learn what properties of the DOM are good predictors of which algorithm to use? I think, uh, so one example is I think he found that any DOM tree over 750 elements is a really good, uh, is really good uh, heuristic to use for picking the parallel one. Um, so some of the, so, so Diane actually implemented that, that one in our current engine. Um, but he's uh, done a whole bunch of these for different properties, and I think they're planning to explore uh, more like what would be good predictors of style system performance, how many threads should you use for web render uh, based on various things. Um, we did some more work with power management um, uh, with some people at UChicago. Um, we've been trying to do more sort of like incremental computation that doesn't involve a smart programmer thinking and figuring out all of the edge cases. Um, that's really all the stuff. We have a prototype web Bluetooth implementation done by some people at the University of Seged. Um, there's some videos I can point you to if you're interested in that. Um, and then the new one that we're just starting, uh, that's why the academic's name isn't listed here, it's Alan is on our team, um, to do software transactional memory. This is in service of getting the script and layout uh, running simultaneously more often. Um, so we we'll try to get that done as much as possible. Okay, that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Just a little bit about what the flow and it's like to just set over all the style data, basically. About what's in the flow tree? Yeah. So, we, so when we do flow construction, we take the information, we do uh, style resolution, and then we take that data and we create the flow tree. And the flow tree actually has no links back to the DOM side data, so that while we're doing layout on flows, um, we're not reading any data that might be mutated by the script thread. So we... we um, Let's see, all the, all the uh, CSS data, res resolved data is in there. Um, we, basically, the, the idea behind the flow tree is there's uh, you know, block flows and all this normal kind of uh, flows are arranged in the tree structure. And then the things inside the flows, we call them, um, oh, help me out. What are the things inside of flows called? Fragments. Fragments. Um, so the flow tree structure itself is immutable once it's been created, but the fragments can be um, redone during like line breaking and stuff like that. So we can rewrite those. Uh, so it's sort of to the frame tree? It, it's, it's very similar to the frame tree. The, the, the main difference is that when we do the layout algorithms, the data access patterns have to be predictable. So when we, we, we organize uh, layout in um, a set of tree traversals, top down, bottom up, top down, or, the, or, or, or some set of those. And when we're, we're operating in one of those traversals, like if you're going bottom up, then you can't read uh, your ancestors or your siblings. You can only access the children that have already completed. So, so unlike sort of like Gecko's layout, which you, know, you start at the root node and you just call do layout, and it can access any data it wants in the entire tree, like ours are much more restricted. Um, but, other, but otherwise, the tree construction is, is probably very similar. The, the one difference is we construct the flow trees in parallel. Um, 
which I think other browsers don't do. Yep. I see you are integrating this with uh, Gecko. The Netflix integrates with Web. Is there the plan to, to have a full web engine at the end with a full browser? So we're we want to have a full web engine at the end. Um, but we don't want to like hide in a corner for five years or 10 years or however long it takes to get to a full web engine before there's anything useful to show. Mm -hmm. So we've been trying to find ways to get the technology into the hands of, of users as fast as possible, whether that be through um, embedders, like uh, you can imagine something like Electron, where uh, if you're doing your own content, like you can control what content goes through the engine so you can make sure it's content that works. Um, um, or these in integrations like with Gecko. So the Gecko one, because you know we're at Mozilla and there was a bunch of Gecko engineers interested, it's like we're not doing all of the work there. I, I think we'd be happy to have this technology into other engines. If people were interested in doing it, we'd be happy to help. Um, the the so some of the stuff like Web Render, I think, is easier to get uh, integrated into other engines. Uh, style is particularly hard because all of the optimizations depend heavily on exact memory layouts, and so there's no nice API you can do between the subsystems. Whereas Web Render, as long as you have something that can produce a display list that Web Render likes, then uh, you know you can just use IPC, and they don't necessarily even have to run in the same process. Anything else? Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, thanks very much.